All right, now let's try our hand at composing a first species counterpoint. So meet our Cantus firmus. We need to get to know this thing really well. So seeing it, analyze it, memorize it. It's not just a bunch of individual dots on the page. Treat it like a real melody. All right, I'm gonna play it and then I'm gonna sing it. This melody is in E minor, it's nine notes long, and has a range of a perfect fifth. I hear this melody in two gestures, measures one to five, and then five through nine. The apex is in measure two. That leap of a perfect fifth resolves by step in the opposite direction. In the A in measure three, I hear it connected with the A in measure six. Now, in other words, I'm hearing measures three, four, and five, like they're expanding an overall gesture of E, B, A, G, F sharp, E. Is this important? Well, I don't know, but I'm for just about anything that's gonna help us know the Cantus Firmus better. So here it is again. La mi re ti do re do ti la. Okay, spoiler alert, I already know how this piece ends and you should too. The rules for approaching the final are immutable, so that's where we should start. So the, the counterpoint final, the E, is going to need to be an octave higher than the cantus firmus. It can't be unison because we can't approach it in contrary motion, and two octaves is too far apart. So the cantus firmus is ending 2-1, as expected, and the counterpoint needs to approach the final perfect octave by contrary motion. Since we're in E minor, 7-1 at the cadence requires the leading tone into E, which is D sharp. What is the harmonic interval there in measure eight? It's a major sixth. Contrary motion into our perfect octave. We also need to start the counterpoint with a perfect consonance. I think a perfect unison is out of the question, uh, but we're free to use either a perfect octave or a perfect fifth. So just to shake things up, I'm going to go with a perfect fifth. Actually, this is a perfect twelfth, right? This is the outer range limit between our voices. But since the cantus firmus is getting ready to leap up a fifth, uh, the distance between the voices will contract quickly. So I think we'll be all right. Your instincts are going to be to write this note to note, going from measure one to measure two, measure two to measure three. Uh, this method of composition is like the game where you try to tell a story between two people and each person only gets to add a single word at a time. Once upon a time there was a big spaceship and aliens and mercenaries and war and betrayal and romance and karate and credits the end hmm. we should write a screenplay together cool 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 this is not always an effective method instead i recommend thinking in terms of large scale contour or by longer melodic gestures and that's at least three notes at a time if i'm beginning my counterpoint on b and it needs to end on E, a perfect fifth lower, I have to have a plan to get me there. Now I mentioned earlier hearing the overall gesture of the cantus firmus as E, B, A, G, F sharp, E. Now I'm seeing another possibility. 
uh, where measures two and three are interrupting a stepwise melodic line from E to F sharp in measure four. Now by temporary sh temporarily shelving measures two and three, uh, the melodic line now goes E, F sharp, G, A, G, F sharp, E. Now if this were the cantus firmus, not only would it be too short, the contour is really lame. It just goes up and down a scale. But measures two and three are providing the needed melodic interest and variety. So I'm not going to worry about measures two and three until the end. Let's focus on the stepwise descent of the cantus firmus in measures six through nine. Since the counterpoint in measure eight created a six with the cantus firmus, I can create parallel sixths in measure six through eight. Measures four through six of the cantus firmus rise stepwise from F sharp to A. Well, I can create a voice exchange in measures four through six with a passing G in measure five. So now, if I leave out measures two and three, the only thing I haven't done so far, the counterpoint starts on B, then walks stepwise all the way down to E, and punctuates the cadence with the leading tone. Again, not terribly interesting. If I play both parts together, leaving measures two and three out, works well. But now we can focus on measures two and three. Since the cantus firmus is leaping up, I want to move in contrary motion as small a distance as possible in the counterpoint. Well, I can't move down stepwise because the B to A are a harmonic dissonance, a seventh. Instead, I can skip down a third to a G. That's creating a sixth. Uh, in measures two and three, parallel sixths might work. Right? Yeah, that works great. Ooh, between measures three and four, I have another voice exchange, but this time I don't have that passing perfect octave. Yeah. All right, so let's listen to the counterpoint melody by itself. Now together, the counterpoint and cantus firmus sound like this. Now I've only used contrasting and parallel motion. I've approached all the perfect consonances in contrary motion. Uh, let's listen to it one more time with both voices together. There's actually one weakness between the interaction of these melodies. It's a, a preference rule, but can you spot it? We'll listen to it one more time. If you can think of what it is, email me. Let me know. All right. Uh, there is homework on Blackboard for you to do. Part one is error detection in first species counterpoint. And part two is writing a first species counterpoint over the cantus firmus. And that's it for today. Thanks.